Good morning. I'm Councilmember Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to this joint hearing with the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Today we discuss a proposed pilot program to study so-called day fines, as well as a bill on tracking the collateral consequences of drug arrests and convictions in the city. The civil and criminal justice systems have long relied on fines as a part, of a part of a matrix of sanctions designed to increase compliance with laws involving everything from trash collection to criminal offenses. We're getting some feedback. Door shut, door shut. I wonder if this is. Let's see if that works. Our laws generally establish <clears throat> a range or exact dollar amount as the fine for a given offense. Looking at data from the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings from the past year, we see that the average fine for failure to remove canine waste was $147.05. That's an awful lot of money for many New Yorkers, while for others, it may simply be the cost of doing business, so to speak. For many decades, that duality has raised questions about whose behavior we are actually correcting with our fines and about what happens when people truly cannot afford to pay. In 1996, the United States Department of Justice found that when fines are set at levels that make it difficult or impossible for poor defendants to pay, their failure to pay in many cases led to jail sentences. Before that, in the 1980s, there was a movement to take an individual's ability to pay into account in setting fines. <clears throat> it was already understood that fixed fines, fines that were too high for people living in poverty to afford, contributed to a burgeoning mass incarceration and mass probation crisis. In 1987, the very Institute of Justice and the National Institute of Justice piloted a project, study, project to study fines that were set by taking into consideration the individual's ability to pay, along with the seriousness of the offense. Their pilot was in Staten Island, and others followed around the country. These projects each looked at graduating economic sanctions. We call them day fines because they are calculated based on an individual's adjusted daily income. But they faced opposition in a political climate that tolerated or even favored harsh punitive approaches to civil and criminal justice. <clears throat> Despite years of discussion and bipartisan support, such proposals have yet to take hold including here in New York City. But the consequences for failing to adjust our system of assessing and collecting fines may be very serious. This seriousness becomes tr became tragically clear in the aftermath of civil unrest resulting from controversial fines and policing in Ferguson, Missouri. The need for a more thoughtful approach is clear. Today, we will hear testimony regarding a proposal to bring a day fines pilot to the New York City Office of Administrative Trials and hearings. The pilot would be limited to a set number of offenses and would be administered through an external nonprofit with a goal of producing a report to guide us in the future. We may finally be at a moment where it is politically possible to address the problem that has been recognized and debated for more than 30 years. We will also hear testimony concerning a pre-considered bill sponsored by Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel, which would require citywide auditing of the many ways that city agencies create or exacerbate collateral consequences of drug arrests and convictions, whether for their employees or for the New Yorkers who receive their services. And with that, I turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Cabrera, for his opening remarks. Thank you so much, and good morning. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair to the Committee on Governmental Operations. I want to thank my colleague and co-chair, Council Member Lori Lansman, for holding this hearing today and for his long-standing commitment to making our justice system more equitable for all New Yorkers. Today the committee will be hearing two pieces of legislation that intend to address disparities in the city justice system. Pre-considering intro, sponsored by Speaker Johnson, will require the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to create a defined pilot program in conjunction with a nonprofit organization 
The office will additionally be required to report findings and recommendations based on the pilot. Building on my co-chair's remarks, a day fine program will take into account a person's income when a judge is determining the amount of civil penalty to impose. Right now, when an oath judge imposes a civil penalty, it is imposed based on the type of violation for penalties assessed against individuals. This increase based on the penalty and the number of repeat violations. Currently, oath judges do not take into account the defendant's ability to pay. This bill will pilot a program of their fines at oath that will give administrative judge, judges discretion to impose penalties based on an individual's ability to pay. The underlying principle here being that, the, that each individual will bear an equal burden by being penalized but pay a different amount in fine. The second bill to be heard today, a pre-considered intro sponsored by Council Member Lika Ampri Samuel, will require the Department of Health and Mental Health and Mental Hygiene and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to conduct an audit of collateral consequences of drug-related arrests and convictions across city agencies. This bill will also establish a task force that will study the consequences of drug-related arrests and convictions on both city employees and members of the public who regularly interface with city agencies. The task force will the task force will make recommendations to the city about ways in which it can implement a harm reduction model for its employees and its program and service delivery. I look forward to a comprehensive discussion today with the administration, advocates, and members of the public on these bills as well as the community service program administered by O for certain violations designated by the Criminal Justice Reform Act enacted last session. I also want to thank our committed staff who do a fantastic and marvelous job. Daniel Collins, Emily Ford Jones, Elizabeth Cron, Sebastian Bacci, as well as the staff of the Committee on Justice Systems and my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible. With that, I'll turn it back to my co-chair. All right, now we'll hear from our first panel from the administration. Um, I understand we have representatives from uh, MACJ and from the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, Oath. Um, is there also a representative from the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene? All right, are you, ma'am, is she going to be testifying or? What's that? Q&A. Q &A. All right. Um, would you like to sit up at the, the table? If you're going to be doing Q&A at some point, we'd need to swear you in anyway. Plus, the view is much better from here. <laughs> All right. So um, let's get you sworn in, and we'll get started. Can you raise your right hand? You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Good. Thank you. Um, as between Mock J and, and Oath, I, I don't know if you have a preference. Who goes first? Am I on? Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman Lanceman, uh, Chairman Cabrera, and members of the Committee on Justice Systems and Committee on Governmental Operations. Uh, thank you. My name is David Golden. I am the Administrative Justice Coordinator in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, I will be giving the testimony, and then I have with me uh, to answer questions uh, John Burns, uh, the uh, first deputy uh, commissioner and supervising administrative law judge at Oath. I'm also joined for purposes of answering questions with respect to the second intro to be discussed today by, from the Department of Health, uh, Dr. Denise Payon, and from Mock J, Chelsea Davis, the Director of Health Initiatives. As you know, uh, Mock J advises the mayor on public safety strategy and together with partners inside and outside government, develops and implements policies that promote safety and fairness and reduce unnecessary incarceration. As Administrative Justice Coordinator, 
I work with the city's administrative tribunals on matters of shared concern across agencies and on the use of civil adjudication in enforcement of the city's health and safety regulations. In recent years, the council has taken critical steps to promote equity and fairness in the city's enforcement of those regulations. In particular, in May 2016, the council passed the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which substituted civil tickets returnable to the city's Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings for certain low-level offenses that were previously issued criminal summonses. These offenses include violations of open container, littering, and unreasonable noise laws. With the passage and implementation of the CJRA, criminal summonses for these offenses have been reduced by more than 90%. Failure to appear at criminal court results in an arrest warrant. Researchers at the Data Collaborative for Justice have estimated that the CJRA has likely resulted in 63,000 fewer criminal warrants in its first 18 months in effect. For offenses adjudicated at oath under the CJRA, respondents have the option of participating in an educational module instead of paying a fine. To date, more than one in three individuals found in violation have chosen to complete the community service educational module. The CJRA reflects principles of fostering fairness and economic justice in enforcement, which Mock J shares with the council. Advancing those same principles, the city lightened the touch of law enforcement in other ways, resulting in a 79% decrease in criminal summonses through year-end 2018 since the beginning of the administration. As required by state law, people issued a criminal summons and found guilty of even a violation must pay a mandatory surcharge of $120. Taking steps to reduce the likelihood that an individual comes into contact with the criminal justice system means reducing the chances they will have to pay a costly and often unaffordable court fee. We continue to work with stakeholders both within and outside city government to examine the ways our criminal justice system subjects individuals to financial penalties, and in particular, how those penalties impact individuals who can least afford them. We work with law enforcement, prosecutors, and the courts to create pre-arrest diversion opportunities for individuals facing economic and mental health challenges so they can avoid the criminal justice system altogether. We are also examining opportunities to expand the use of community service. We believe that in certain cases, community service in the form of educational engagement is a more appropriate penalty than a fine. For example, where the underlying offense is minor and does not cause harm to another person, both the individual and the city benefit from initiatives that seek to educate and correct behavior rather than penalize. Against that background, Mock J offers these comments on the intro at issue today. In keeping with our overall approach and research interests, we are familiar with the use of DAFINE models in the criminal law context, both abroad and as part of pilots in the United States. DAFINE models start from a sound premise. Acknowledgement that a $100 fine impacts a person making minimum wage differently than a person earning a six-figure salary. We believe this is an important issue to examine but we want to highlight four critical issues that need to be addressed in developing the pilot proposed in the intro. First, we note that the penalties now imposed for violations of the city's health and safety codes are constrained by statutes enacted by the council and are specifically set forth in penalty schedules adopted by the various enforcement agencies. Those schedules were adopted to maintain uniformity in adjudication outcomes and prevent disparate results in cases involving similarly situated individuals and facts. For most of the relevant statutes, significant changes in the penalties to be imposed for violations would require specific legislation. Then amending those penalty schedules to take into account legitimate considerations of equity and fairness would require agency rulemaking as mandated by the city charter. We believe the council should involve the city's enforcement agencies in designing a pilot program to address these issues. The enforcement agencies, not oath, are most familiar with the relationship between where and how many tickets they issue, what penalties they impose and why, 
and how to craft an enforcement approach best calculated to maintain health and safety without economic unfairness and overall inequity. Likewise, the agencies can and should help inform enforcement strategies that reduce disproportionate financial penalties by increasing reliance on, for example, agency-issued warnings or demonstrations of compliance by respondents. Moreover, a successful adjustment of the penalty schedules to promote equity and fairness should also protect a respondent's ability to resolve an outstanding summons directly with the agency that issued it without requiring the unnecessary involvement of oath. Second, many specific features of the traditional day fine model reflect its development and use in a criminal rather than civil enforcement context. In addition, we believe that that model may in some respects be too procedurally complex and time consuming to implement without significant modifications when it comes to tickets returnable to oath. Instead of importing the traditional day fine model, we suggest the council may want to consider developing a different approach that more efficiently takes into consideration the respondent's financial situation. For example, consideration could be given to setting penalty schedules with three or four tiers corresponding to income levels and or a fee waiver for individuals who are indigent. Consideration could also be given to expanding the use of community service to other offenses adjudicated at oath or at New York City's summons courts. Third, we note that if the council determines that a not-for-profit organization should play a role in designing the pilot program, budget and procurement issues would need to be addressed requiring time to implement. Whether the work of evaluating the pilot is done by such an organization or otherwise by the city, we agree that it could yield needed data and research on the use of ability to pay models in courts. Although much has been written about the need for evaluating an individual's ability to pay when setting a penalty, much of the field research is outdated or anecdotal. Data on the cost of implementation and the impact on collection rates and amounts collected, for example, could help determine what the appropriate use of standardized ability to pay calculations should be in other contexts. Fourth, and finally, we understand the intro is not intended to include offenses that were moved to oath as part of the CJRA. We think that intent should be made explicit by incorporating language clarifying that CJRA offenses would not be included in the pilot. As mentioned earlier, individuals found in violation of those offenses can avoid paying the fine altogether by selecting the community service option. The availability of this option mitigates concerns about economic inequality. The administration is committed to promoting equity and fairness in criminal and civil enforcement of the city's laws and will carefully study this issue in a thoughtful manner with the appropriate enforcement agencies. We look forward to working with the council toward this end in amendments to the proposed intro. Turning towards the second pre-considered intro mandating a citywide audit of collateral consequences, the city is committed to ensuring equity and fairness and recognizes the barriers collateral consequences impose. This core value was rooted in the work of the mayor's task force on cannabis legalization and our support for the expungement of criminal records for past cannabis offenses. We thank the state for championing expungement for cannabis offenses this past session. Regarding the legislation being heard today, we support the proposed expansion of the Municipal Drug Strategy Council to examine the impact of collateral consequences as it relates to controlled substances. However, there are a number of legal and operational questions posed by this bill that we need to investigate further with the City Council. For example, given public safety considerations implicated for various employees as well as additional legal obligations and oversight by federal and state entities, we recommend defining collateral consequence to exclude adverse agencies, adverse actions agencies are required by law to impose and for which there is no discretion. Similarly, we should ensure that any reporting requirements exclude private health information obtained in a clinical or treatment context. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Are we hearing from uh, Oath or no? 
Uh, no, I'm here for a Q and A. Okay, good. Thanks. Let me note um, we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Farrah Lewis from uh, Brooklyn and Councilmember Debbie Rose from Staten Island. Good. So um, let me get the questioning uh, started. My understanding is your your first uh, objection that you lay out is that uh, we note that p the penalties now imposed for violations of the city's health and safety codes are constrained by statutes enacted by the council. So. And then you go on, it, it sounds like you're concerned that in the administrative code, the council has established certain uh, fine levels and that this pilot upends that. Um, since the council is the body that is establishing the fines, what is your uh, concern or, or problem with the council saying, we're gonna do a pilot where these fines that we set are going to be uh, different and they're going to be potentially uh, met through a, a day fine model? What's wrong with the council changing what the council's determined the fine should be? Well, we're trying to point out that there are some complexities built into this process, that we would be talking about the need for additional legislation which would identify the specific ad code provisions that would be affected. That's what was done in CJRA. And then, in addition, there would be a need for rulemaking under CAPA, and those would be preconditions not to implementing an entire reform package as was done under CJRA, but to conducting a pilot program, which means that as we gathered data and made adjustments through the pilot program, we might have to repeat the process in order to adjust and incorporate new violations and different penalty schedules in light of what we learned. I don't know, it seems that the bill was designed to give uh, the administration the maximum flexibility in implementing the, the, the pilot program. What, what you're suggesting, you know, it seems uh, rigid and, and uh, would ultimately limit the, the flexibility of, of, of oath in the administration to kind of craft the pilot in a way that, that, that you thought made sense. I mean, as a council member, I, I probably have no problem with the idea that we should just lay out for you exactly what you should do and how you should should do it. Um, and in terms of elsewhere in in, in this first uh, ob objection, the the advice or the suggestion that these particular offenses and their relative fines should be determined in consultation with the agencies that are responsible for for writing those summonses or overseeing that area of jurisdiction. I mean, the, these are these are these are the admin's agencies. I mean, the oath and mock J and the admin would be just as capable as communicating with the fire department and DEP and whoever else as the council. No. Well, I think that we can communicate with those agencies, but I think that we want to bring the agencies into a collaboration with this committee and with the council, these committees and with the council, in order to be able to work collaboratively. So, how, on, how, does, uh, let, let how me, does the structure of the pilot preclude that, though? That's what I, what I don't understand. Well, what I'm saying is that I think that when we look at a pilot program, um, we need to make sure we've all got the same basic orientation that we want to enhance economic fairness. We want to try and promote equity. We have a wide range of violations, a wide range of enforcement schemes. Those schemes are also concerned about maintaining public health and safety individual agencies that are involved in enforcement are in the best position to determine what impact on public health and safety is going to arise if we make changes. We need that input. We need their input in order to be able to identify who is being affected by the violations that are being issued today. They are the ones who actually have inspectors issuing officers in the field who have data and experience with who's being impacted by their penalties. And we're not necessarily talking, as we were in the CJRA context, about an individual on the street who's getting a ticket from a police officer. Uh, we may be talking in the cases of some of these violations about economic fairness and equity issues, but we're talking about somebody who is a homeowner, a property owner, or a small business owner. Um, that gets into a more complicated analysis of who's being affected and we need that input from the agencies in order to inform what we design. No, I understand, and, and I, I, ho I, I hope I'm not being uh, obtuse, but wh why can't you, 
Mock J, Oath, whoever else in the administration, talk to the Department of Sanitation or DEP or Fire Department, whomever is, is the issuing agency or the responsible agency for the summonses, the categories of offenses that, that you're being empowered to select. Like, why can't, what about the, the way this pilot project is structured that prevents, would prevent you from, from engaging in that dialogue? I, I think it's fully expected that you would engage in that dialogue and consultation with those agencies. I don't, I don't see how this, the bill as written precludes that. Well, we can, we will, that's ongoing now, and we will be, in any event, consulting further with the council as those conversations develop. We just wanted to point out in this paragraph that the process of translating that into a pilot program, we believe, is more complex than simply directing that a pilot program be established. There's going to be a need for specific legislation and for rulemaking that will be part of that process. We would envision that being obviously consultative since the legislation would happen here. We would be coming back to the council to establish that where we are going with this is consistent with the council's expectations that we all understand what we're doing here. We're just pointing out that there are those complexities and one of the reasons why we think that it merits considering other options and why we would want to flag that because those might be things that we would be considering presenting as part of this pilot or developing simultaneously is because given that, uh, this might be a good time to broaden our vision of economic fairness here and talk about other options that would also contribute, like a tiered system, like an expansion of community service, like more reliance on using warnings rather than financial penalties to try to affect people's behavior. So, so those are all good points. Um, let, let's move on to the, the, the second category of, of objection or um, concern. Um, second, many specific features of the traditional day fine model reflect its development and use in a criminal rather than civil enforcement context. And then you say, in addition, we believe that that model may in some respects be too procedurally complex and time consuming. W what is it about the fact that the traditional day fine model was developed in the criminal justice context and we're now looking to do a pilot in the civil justice context? Why, why is that a distinction that matters? For a couple of reasons. First, we just wanted to flag the fact that the impetus towards day fines when that concept was first originated in Scandinavia and then expanded to Western Europe and as it was trialed in the United States 20, 30 years ago was as an alternative to incarceration. The important point uh, that people uh, took away from it was that you could say to people rather than having to go to jail because you can't afford to pay, we can adjust the fine. Um, with the CJRA, we have an approach in which we have taken many of the meaning, same Sorry, kinds. meaning in those systems, a person might face either incarceration or a fine. Right. But if they, a fixed fine, and if they couldn't afford the fine, well then, for all practical right. purposes, the, they could only be incarcerated. Yeah, the, and the idea behind calling it a day fine goes back to the idea that that's a day that you could be spending in jail or that you could be paying for. There are references to it as a ransom system in which you're essentially paying you know, okay, for, that, so for that day in jail. So we think that with something like CJRA, taking offenses out of the category of those that you could be incarcerated for and out of the category that you pay for and saying you can perform community service and avoid either incarceration or the financial impact, we have a process that addresses the same issue, the same underlying issue, avoiding incarceration without the concern about financial impact for those who are unable to pay altogether. But let me put that aside. I just wanted to mention that uh, by way of introduction. Listen, we're, we're, we're very proud of the CJRA and, and, and the less reliance on, on, on incarceration. Um, just bef before you move on, to make the observation that, that the CJRA didn't solve all of the um, ills and inequities of the, the justice system. And I remember at the time, having been very involved, there was a lot of discussion about, okay, we're gonna be imposing fines on people. Uh, 
this very topic, these are, for some people, these are still high fines. So now we're moving on to that. Okay. Trying to deal with that. But okay. So no, I, th I, th I th think we're absolutely on the same page with that. But so move on to the issue about procedural complexity and uh, consuming time. A uh, couple of things. First of all, uh, criminal court proceeding is, in a sense, fundamentally coercive. That is, if you don't show up, you are subject to a bench warrant. If you are in that process, ultimately you have to provide certain information. I don't want to overdo the coercive aspect of it, but you are compelled to provide information which is used as part of the ultimately sentencing process, what we have here in the city through the Criminal Justice Agency. So the idea that as part of that process you provide income data is not fundamentally different from the way that the process works already. In the administrative enforcement area, hearings at oath and in other administrative agencies, we have a very different process. It's not coercive. It is not forcing people under the threat of the issuance of a warrant uh, to appear. It's true that if there is a default, we have the ability to docket that as a civil judgment, but that is the extent to which the system is compulsory. Um, we are not extracting from people the kind of information that you would need in order to establish income. That would be a significant change. Right now, the process is one which is, and we have worked hard on maintaining and enhancing this over the years, streamlined. It is amenable to people's participation remotely. We are very sensitive to the fact that when you come into a hearing at oath or any other agency, there are costs that you are already incurring in terms of the time that you're taking off from work, the interruption of education, childcare arrangements, transportation costs. We want to minimize that. Um, so any step such as requiring people to provide information about income, creating more steps in the process in order to add to what's going on in adjudication, any step which works against maintaining the efficiency of that process. It's, I'll say, customer friendliness. Obviously, we're not literally talking about customers, but it's friendliness for respondents. Anything which cuts against that is something that gives us pause. And that's why we're suggesting, again, that some of these other options, including having simple tiers, including using warnings, expanding community service, and the like, may be worthy of giving so, more consideration. Right. So I, I think you acknowledge, or at least it's implicit in, in what you said, that there's a coerce, coercive element to uh, a civil ticket. If one does not show up, there are consequences. It's reduced to a judgment. It's not The consequences are not as dramatic as a warrant is issued for your arrest and you could end up um, going, to, going to jail. So uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a matter of degree. Let me ask you about the um, the uh, the gathering of the information. Um, how much? How, how would how would I could imagine in in my mind where the gathering of the the financial information necessary to make a determination about what someone should um, be able to pay five or ten questions. At most, a form you, you fill out. Um, my understanding is this is not envisioned where people have to show up with tax returns or pay stubs or W-2s or anything. It's self-reporting, and administrative judges are bright, smart people and capable of discerning whether someone is completely misrepresenting themselves. Uh, how much time do you think it would take to, to determine I mean, how, many, how, many, how much information does, do you think a, a judge would need to, to, to make a determination about what this person can, can afford in the, in the, in the, in the um, construct of a, of, a, of a day fine? Well, you know, this is something that we're obviously in the first stages of thinking about, and I don't know that I can give you a uh, very highly developed answer to that. I think that if we are talking about something which grows out of the day fine concept. And again, I want to stress how much we're all in agreement 
that adjusting the financial impact of penalty or alleviating it altogether in light of somebody's financial circumstances is absolutely something that we need to look at uh, consistent with maintaining health and safety. Um, you know, I think that how much we want to go the day fine route of saying, this is the essence of the day fine concept, precisely calibrated to somebody's income. That's why we're talking about having a multiplier in a formula um, versus a more general category. Um, you know, I think that we have to look at how much more would that complicate the system. Every time you collect data in a system, every time you say to a judge as part of an adjudicative process, there now needs to be a framework for inputting that into how you determine the outcome of the case, and there needs to be a basis on which that can be challenged by somebody who participates in the system and reviewed on appeal, you introduce complications into the process. All right. It doesn't seem very burdensome. Again, if, if we are willing to allow people to, to self-report, uh, you know, five questions. What do you do for a living? What you pay? Little math. I mean, this, it just doesn't seem like it's a lot. And, and the fact that Oath doesn't do that now, it's not because you don't have a reason to do it. It's, it's something that's done in, 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 the, in the much uh, more fraught uh, criminal justice environment um, thousands of times a, a, a day. I, I understand it's a new thing to do, but there's nothing um, about the way that Oath is set up or, the, or, or its structure that, that would preclude having a system asking those, those series of questions, which, which, again, we leave it to oath, we leave it to the administration to figure out what are the questions that you need to ask. Well, if I could just respond to that yeah. for a moment, because I think this illustrates part of the issue in the collaborative process, which I really do want to stress we're eager to participate in. Um, if we're talking about small businesses, and we certainly think that there are small businesses that face stresses from economic regulations, and if we are thinking about this issue generally, we would want to consider, I think that the kind of approach that you're discussing may require some modification as we start talking about how we assess the income or the financial viability of a business. Um, you know, maybe we want to say that's too complicated and it's a great idea, but we can't do it. Maybe we want to say we need to think more creatively about how we could incorporate that into the model. But, you know, I'm just saying, I think that those are the kinds of issues that we need to explore further and that we think can be fleshed out in amendments to this intro. Now, the idea of doing tiers, I assume you're talking about for a particular offense, instead of there being a fixed fine, maybe that fine will be, is, is fixed at a higher amount based on previous uh, findings of, 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 uh, of guilt, you would have uh, uh, four tiers based on a person's ability to pay. Fine might be ten dollars, twenty-five dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. I don't. I, I'm not the sponsor of the bill, so I'm not here to, to to negotiate it in that way. But I get that, and I could see where that would make sense and potentially um, ease some administrative challenge of trying to, to to finally and perfectly calibrate. You know that this person can pay twenty-eight dollars a day as opposed to just lumping them to a tier. But wouldn't, the, wouldn't it still be necessary to collect the financial data from that person to, to figure out which tier they're in? Like either way, your, your suggested way or the bill's language, you gotta figure out what the person can afford. Yeah, you need to collect something, but you might just collect the information that somebody is eligible or represents that they're eligible for certain benefits. Okay. Um, all right, I, I've got some more questions, but I, I, I know my co-chair does, and I'm sure other members do as well. We mentioned we've been joined um, by uh, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez uh, from Manhattan and Council Member um, uh, Bill Perkins from Manhattan. Mr. Cabrera. Thank you so much, and welcome, and thank you for all the good work that you do. Um, 
According to uh, recent figures from open data between October 2018 and 2019, the most frequent cited violations stem from the Department of Sanitation. There were 59,398 charges for failure to clean 18 inches from the street, and the average fine was $148.66. There were 52,276 seven charges for having a dirty sidewalk with an average fine of $162.19. Uh, can you please let us know why are these the most cited offenses out of the tens of thousands that get heard at oath? I'm not sure uh, how to answer why a particular offense is more commonly written other than to say that it's one that um, is frequently observed, um, has an impact on the community, is part of an enforcement approach that relies on the individual property owner, which may be a business owner, which may be a homeowner, uh, to be responsible for an area that is also used by others. Um, and uh, that, again, I think is important to maintaining the overall cleanliness and safety of the city. Uh, obviously, it's an area that we can look at in terms of the kind of economic fairness issues that we're raising here, but in terms of why that violation is more commonly written than others, I would think those would be the factors. Have you done an internal study as to where most of these tickets are, are being given? Are we talking about communities of people of color? Uh, are we talking about uh, communities where uh, people are wealthy? Uh, where are these tickets given and have you done an internal assessment? If you haven't, why not? Uh, we do have those data. I don't have them here today. We can supply them to you. For, so from what I hear, uh, they are in communities of people of color. That's my sources are telling me that's where it's, it's I mean, it's, it's glaring. Uh, would love for us to have a discussion regarding that because I, I, it would be kind of odd uh, that it was seen that uh, the, the bell curve will be uh, more in community and people's color or there's targeting that take, is taking place, which is my inclination and uh, based on what, I, on what I do know. And that will be rather disturbing uh, and we would need to tackle that right away because uh, it is be baffling to me uh, to understand why there would be any other answer other than that one. And so can we get that information and also not just from the Department of Sanitation, from all of the other agencies as well? Uh, and, and this request is not one that I'm asking and then we all forget about it because I, I really want to pursue this and entertaining a hearing regarding this uh, because that, that seems to be disturbing. In light of everything we're talking about here today, um, there could be another undercarrying issue that we're dealing with uh, here. Uh, anything you want to address regarding what I just said or? I mean, we can look into the data and we can certainly let you know what we have. Okay, um, great. By when do you think that we could get a hold of that? I'm sorry? By when do you think that we could get a hold of that? I, I don't know. I mean, we can update you and your staff as we look into this and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to be clear because uh, this they find, and maybe I'll ask the advocates as well, uh, we're not talking about 
We, we're talking about uh, a re looking into the potential of reduction in, uh, in the fines based on someone's income, but we're not talking about increasing uh, fines for those who can't afford to compensate uh, for those who are, you know, an, an economic disadvantage position. Is that, is that correct? That's my understanding. Um, obviously, we haven't talked about this so far this morning. In the traditional day fine uh, programs, that is an aspect. It is an aspect. To increase the upper levels. You know, I, I personally have a problem with that approach. I'm going to tell you why. If right now it seems reasonable and logical and we feel that justice says when you commit uh, this infraction, you should pay this. I mean, that's really goes all the way down to the Constitution. You should pay. F it almost seems like you're paying for what you're paying and then paying for somebody else's. I, 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 the second piece is that from the outside, and I, and I think it's, it's a good way to look at it. You know, these fines were never intended originally and should never uh, be the intentions uh, to fill our coffers here. And so I, I'm just curious as to why would anybody want to increase? Uh, it's almost like a penalty if, if you're doing well. Uh, if the reality is, this is what I did, this is what I should pay. It's almost like you're paying for somebody else's uh, as well. Or the intention is that we're trying to raise more funds and that should not be really the end game. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I honestly believe, as we have discussed the intro on the table today, that although we are referring to day fine programs, we're really only referring to the half of the day fine model that involves reducing penalties or removing them entirely for people who are unable to pay the basic penalty. We're not talking about the other half of the model that expands penalties for people with higher incomes. That's great, because you know, I just want to point a clarification there, because uh, I, I know how things in government take place. We start here and then government starts looking for ways to fund other things or we go into a recession. I remember when we went to the recession, I was here uh, and the administration then starts ticketing everybody. We had over a, almost, what was it, a billion dollars worth of tickets. It was, it was ridiculous. Uh, and that was the way they were trying to balance the budget. I don't want us to go that way. I, I do foresee you eventually we'll enter, enter into another recession. Our debt here that we have is going to go over $100 billion, service debt at $9 billion. Uh, it's going to be harder this next time to be able to make those payments and to run all the programs we want to run. And I, I just hope that it doesn't spiral. I appreciate that. My, my last question is I know we have colleagues that have questions. Uh, and it's in reference to those. Uh, does oath recommend or offer payment plans uh, for paying fines? And if so, how often do people enter into the payment plans? And if so, are there limits on payment plans? For example, minimum payment, a maximum duration of the payment, et cetera. Well, as part of oath's uh, mission is adjudication. Once we've finished an adjudication, it then goes to a period of time where the uh, respondent, whether it's a business or an individual, would have to make the payment. And that is usually always sent not to any, it, it goes to the central fund and it's DOF. And the Department of Finance takes care of that. We don't enter into any sliding scale or analysis of somebody, uh, or we, we don't have the ability to mitigate a penalty over a period of time. So the penalty is imposed and it's based on the, the schedule that, uh, the penalty schedule that, that the enforcement agencies have uh, sent forward for us to adjudicate. Is that so something that you would like to have the power to determine an oath? 
as 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 I'm sitting here, uh, it's. I want to um, give you more this power. Is a policy, a policy decision uh -huh. that um, between the administration and the council, we are more than willing to uh, accept whatever the law is, adjudicate that law, uh, as we've been doing for 40 years in the city. Uh, we're a neutral tribunal. Whatever you and the administration, the uh, chair, want to agree on, we're there. We'll do it. Just give me enough time and money, and we'll do it. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back, and thank you for, uh, for your response. Uh, turn it back to my co-chair. Sure. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Ben Kalos, Councilmember Keith Powers, and Councilmember Common uh, Yeager. Um, do any of the, the members have questions before I ask some more? Uh, Councilmember Yeager. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, how much did Oath pay the Center for Court Innovation to run the community service component of the Criminal Justice Reform Act? Oh, fan, free, I don't. It's not a free service, right? We had a uh, contract, a demonstration project with them, and for the first 18 months uh, that the Criminal Justice Reform Act was in, in effect, uh, the Center for Court Innovation um, ran that pro uh, program. Approximately 11 months ago, Oath took that program internally, and we now are staffing that program, and the Center for Court Innovation has uh, left that to us using the model that they worked on in the first 18 months of the, of the law. I, as far as the actual figures, we'd ha I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. And uh, how many people use that service? Excuse me? How many people used the, the uh, Center for Court Innovation services during that time that they had the contract? Well, I can tell you right now, as of the 31st of October 2019, um, we have just short of 1,600 um, members of the public respondents that have opted for community service. Okay, so when you find out what that amount is, and I divide it by sixteen hundred dollars by sixteen hundred people, I will find out the cost per person of um, that contract. That might not be as as straightforward as, as as how many people per, but we can give you a number, and uh, we'll let you know what. Okay. The, the Center for Court Innovation, as I've said, uh, handed over the operation of this internally to Oath as, as of well, last voluntarily? January. Sorry. Voluntarily, or you took it back from them? Well, they uh, came in when we started the Criminal Justice Reform Act in, the, uh, in June of 2017. And um, it, was, it was a three-year demonstration project. As we, uh, collaborating with the Center for Court Innovation, realized that um, it might be beneficial to the city uh, to Oath and everybody else, and as far as money saving, that we could in internally um, bring the uh, program into Oath, and that's what we have been doing almost for the last 11 months, We're coming up to the one year anniversary in January. Okay, and um, as I understand it, uh, Oath, uh, should this bill pass, will be using consultants again. They will not be doing it internally, is that correct? It seems from looking at the, the bill, there's a, a, a carve out for an organization but again, it's a policy issue. Whatever is determined between the uh, council and the administration as to how this will operate, oh, we're you're ready the, to do You're it. the administration. Uh, we're, I am the first deputy commissioner and the uh, a supervising administrative law judge at a neutral. You're, you're the first. You're the number one guy because the acting commissioner is not here, right? So you're the first. You are the administration. I, I, I'm uh, for, with an independent neutral tribunal. Our, our position would be as implementing whatever policy is determined by the council and the administration. Okay. We and, adjudicate. And we you, don't set policy. Okay. And, uh, and you'll, you'll let me know what uh, the Center for Court Innovation got, right? Sure. The cash. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right. Let me ask about the um, bill uh, being introduced by Councilmember uh, Ampre Samuel. Um, as you know, the, the council is very concerned about the issue of uh, collateral consequences, uh, particularly uh, for people, uh, for anybody in the criminal justice system, but particularly for people who um, are arrested or, or, char or convicted of a 
drug-related offenses. And the essence of her, her legislation is that um, we do not know uh, across the various and sundry agencies of city government um, how a person's arrest or conviction for a drug-related offense will um, collaterally impact their uh, relationship and interactions with that agency. So for example, um, uh, a mother who is uh, interacting with ACS, uh, whether or not uh, if she has a drug-related arrest or conviction, is that going to be, uh, in, in what ways is that going to be uh, held against her in, in whatever services or, or investigation that ACS is uh, conducting. The, the bill requires an audit um, by an agency designated by the mayor um, of all of the uh, collateral consequences <clears throat> through, across all of the, the city agencies for individuals arrested or convicted of drug offense. And then it um, directs, I guess it's the mayor's office of drug policy to, based on that audit, propose recommendations uh, to the administration for how these agencies can do things uh, differently and, and better. Um, let's start with, does the administration have a position on this legislation? Hi. Um, we share the- oh, Sorry, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chelsea Davis, the Director of Health in Initiatives at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Good morning. Um, and at, at Mock J and in the administration, we certainly share the recognition of the impacts of collateral consequences and the concern about ensuring um, equity and, and fairness in our uh, policy implementation. And so we believe that this analysis of city-imposed collateral consequences related to, to uh, substance use and related to um, drug convictions would be a, a productive analysis to help ensure that we are aligning citywide policy uh, to, to ensure those core values of fairness and, and equity. And we believe that given further discussions to work out some of the, the legal and operational questions that we have, that adding this analysis to the work of the uh, Municipal Drug Strategy Council that's run by uh, DOHMH would be a, a productive way to conduct that analysis. Okay. Um, do you, are there any legal or operational uh, questions that you have that you can tell us today? Sure, so I believe the, the two that were outlined in the testimony are, are some of the major ones. Uh, we'd like to work out the definition of, of collateral consequences and ensure that we're focusing on city imposed or city policy of, on collateral consequences. Um, and we'd also um, wanna make sure that uh, we aren't um, publishing any uh, private health information that was obtained in a clinical setting. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, that the council would want you to uh, audit, to become aware of, and, and to report upon any collateral consequences that are mandated by state law or, or federal law, just so we know them and could give consideration to how we as a city can or, or should, um, I'll just say, deal with those, those impositions. Is there anything anyone else wants to, to add on that? Okay. Um, the, lastly, from me on the on the bill, um, have, has has DOHMH given any thought to what um, should policies that are that are rooted in harm reduction for agencies look like? Um, that is like you know the foundation of the work we do. I don't have anything like very specific. Um, to say other than one of the concerns um, for the health department, um, particularly in the context of the opioid overdose epidemic, is that we you know, think about um, the standard of care for treating an opioid use disorder, methadone and buprenorphine, and that those don't get swept up into you know, a drug testing um, and any kind of collateral consequences that are associated with that which obviously is a harm reduction um, strategy and is also as protective, um, protecting against overdose deaths and retention and treatment. And, and then just lastly, um, you know, the council had asked the admin, I think it was in 2018, um, in response to the last municipal drug strategy council report, 
to, to do such an audit. And I, I feel like I'd be remiss. We want to move forward. We want your support for this bill, and we want this to happen. But, but I do feel like I would be remiss if I didn't say that we, we asked you to do this, essentially, um, over a year ago, to do this audit. It's, I don't want to, I don't want to make you or anyone here feel bad, but it's a really important issue, and it's a little surprising and disappointing to, to, to us that the city, the administration, doesn't, doesn't already know the answer to that question, and what are the collateral consequences for people who have been arrested or convicted of drug offenses in the agencies that the city, the city runs. Um, and so in our dialogue to get to a point where hopefully the admin will support this, this bill, um, I, I, I want to impress upon you the, the need to have a sense of urgency. Um, a lot of the work that the city does, as you well know, uh, reaches deeply into people's lives. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not adversely affecting people beyond what justice and fairness uh, requires. W was there a reason why uh, our, our request that this be done in 2018 wasn't done? Is there some operational legal reason that it requires us to pass a bill to make this happen? I'm not sure if you have anything to add. I'm not aware of that request. I'm happy to look into it and, and find out what happened, but we share the belief that this is incredibly important and I think really look forward to, to finalizing the, the bill and, and having the Municipal Drug Strategy Council work toward this analysis. Well, I, I, I appreciate that very much and I'm, so, I'm sure the sponsor of the bill appreciates that very much. Any other questions? Yes, Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Um, in 1987, the first day fine pilot um, project was launched in Staten Island by the Vera Institute of Justice in partnership with the National Institution, Institute of Justice. However, these pilot programs were short-lived um, as, as day fines never really gained popularity. Um, part of it was due in part to, you know, sort of the tough on crime policies and rhetoric of the time, of during that period. Um, so this won't be the first go round for day fine pilot for the day fine pilot. So what would, do you expect to see differently, or what outcomes do you hope to achieve that you know didn't manifest themselves the first go round? Well, thank you, Member Rose. I think that that, thanks, um, illustrates part of what we've been talking about today, that uh, that was a program that was focused on uh, criminal violations and grew out of a concern with over-incarceration, with over-reliance on incarceration as a means of enforcement in the context often of lower level offenses. One of the things that's changed since that trial was conducted in around 1990 is that as reflected in the testimony and as we've been discussing, uh, the council has enacted, has enacted and we've implemented the CJRA and the effect of that has been to take many of those offenses, move them out of the criminal court context altogether move them into a setting in which there is no longer any option for incarceration, and there is in fact an option for respondents, they're no longer criminal defendants, to fulfill their obligation in the event that they're found in violation through community service in the form of an educational module. So that aspect of what was at issue back when the experiment was conducted in Staten Island has changed. Another issue that we are talking about today is how we would adapt that model to the administrative context. I know in looking over the material that's been published about what was done in Staten Island, some of the issues that I was just discussing, Chair Lanceman raised and that we were just discussing about how you obtain income information uh, the circumstances under which judges are then able to use that 
do reflect the fact that it's a criminal context. But and wouldn't um, uh, another potential um, of the uh, advantage of the day fines model be um, to generate uh, higher revenue? Well, or a couple of things about that. I mean, first of all, I think uh, as we were discussing before uh, Chair Cabrera raised this issue, um, I don't think that we are looking at that aspect of day fine programs, at least as we've been discussing it in the context of a pilot, uh, as something that we would be looking at, raising penalties for people who have higher income. Um, there are a few reasons why that would be true. It would, for all the procedural and operational complexities that we were talking about earlier, I think that those would be quadrupled if we started talking about having a pilot program that temporarily imposed higher penalties on people, if we talked about how we would handle defaults under those circumstances, how we would give people notice, how we would justify having temporary penalties in only certain parts of the city that were higher than for similarly situated people elsewhere in the city. Um, but the larger issue that I would want to mention in connection with that is looking over some of the policy arguments that were made in this country in favor of day fine programs in the 1980s and 1990s, you do see references to these programs as ways of generating revenue. And as Chair Cabrera was mentioning, I think we know now, if people didn't know then, that you want to be very careful before you start looking at a criminal enforcement or an administrative enforcement fine generating program as a way of filling city Revenue coffers. Generation. Uh, and, and that if raises you do, some issues. And if you do, how is this revenue going to be allocated? Um, would it be allocated in terms of maybe creating, you know, more pre-arraignment facilities for youth since we've, um, we've changed the age and... You know, I'd uh, say... I mean, really, there, well, there are obviously well, good things that revenue that flows... And where the, this increased revenue would go. I agree with you. There are good things that government can do with increased revenue that flows into its coffers. We would just say that we should be cautious about relying on enforcement mechanisms to enhance that revenue because as you substitute enforcement generated revenue for tax levy dollars or other sources, uh, that can become addicting for government. And that's something that we've so seen some of the negative consequences to, from. To the purpose of the day program? I'm sorry? It might be counterintuitive to. Well, I just think that that's something that we would want to be very cautious about saying uh, is an aspect of the day fine program that would cause us to adopt it. I think there are other policy arguments in favor of day, pro day fine programs um, that have had more appeal. I think that that one has certainly been raised, but I think it's one that comes with some cautionary signs. I just want, I just want, I'm just concerned about if we are going to generate revenue um, off the backs of, of these folks that it would then be used to improve um, the criminal justice system, such as um, one of my concerns were that the, there were no pre-arraignment, um, you know, facilities for, for youth. Right. who, you know, find themselves in, you know, a part of the increase the age. That, that was just Understood. No, I Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, and we very much look forward to uh, working with you, um, except for this one last question. <laughs> one last question. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Colombo here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> According to Mark J, that's a good one, never been called that before. Uh, September 2018 report on summons, report of, of the 2,000 people, I need my glasses, 
found in violation after a hearing, only 720 chose to complete the e-learning community service module, and the rest chose to pay a fine. Does that mean that most people can't afford the fine, or is there something about the community service that is stopping people from being able to use it? We looked at the level of satisfaction or the response that people have from the community service module, and it's generally been very high. Um, as we mentioned the testimony, one in three people who are found in violation at a hearing do choose it. Almost everybody who chooses it completes it. The feedback is that people are satisfied with it. Um, we are talking about low fine amounts and we're talking about making the community service option available to everybody regardless of income. So it's understandable that there are going to be a significant number of people who are going to be offered the option and who are going to decline it. Because Do you think it's because that, the, is it a work schedule issue? I mean, this, I, when does I, this I, take I, place? I, I don't think it's a work schedule. I understand how this works. Basically, somebody comes in, mm -hmm. they have a hearing, they're found in violation. Right. At that point, they are offered community service as an option in lieu of paying a penalty. It's scheduled, it's available right then and there. So they can, and it's our two if I If I may, uh, uh, Jacob Brayer, one of the technological limitations when we launched this, uh, because we had to weigh the cost of doing it remotely, uh, community service, there was a large number given to us. Technology catches up with us. So we're in the midst of very shortly being able to launch a community service option instead of payment if you're going to admit. And you'll be able to do that remotely and that will hopefully be online, uh, as with a lot of the technological uh, issues that we're working at, the bugs on it, within the next uh, 90 days, I'm hoping. So that if you're in a situation like you're raising, you'll, you'll be able to admit this, uh, the penalty, and instead of just paying a fine, let's say if it's for an open container of $25, you will have the option. So we're gonna see those numbers drive, drive up higher because now you'll have a, a, an hour of the e-learning that you'll be able to do remotely. And just like attorney um, uh, continuing legal assessment, uh, ca uh, continuing legal education, we have built in as part of the technology to make sure that the person doing it is the person that got the fine and they're not uh, paying someone else to do it. So there's safeguards that we, we have incorporated in this. So when we're about to launch this within the next um, a few months, there will be a, a, a presumably a, a greater number of folks being able to do that. The, you had a, heretofore, you had to come in to oath in order to avail of it, even if you wanted to admit. You had to come to the office in one of the you know, five boroughs um, into our hearing location, admit, and then we would send you in and you could do the e-learning. So we're working towards making it a, a lot more transparent and a lot more accessible to members of the public. I have to be honest, community service, to me, when I hear the word community service, I think of someone who's going to be doing something in the community, making the community better. It's, that's not what we're talking about, right? It's just basically an educational module. It's an educational module. They're able, uh, the person's able to sit there, be told why you're here. You know, we do t adopt the principles of um, procedural fairness as part of that so that they understand why they're there, how this happened, what the, na the difference between being in criminal court for your offense versus at, at, at oath a civil administrative law court, uh, and, the, and the consequences their behavior may have um, on, uh, on the city and their, and their fellow residents. That's something that we, you know, when we put the, the uh, module together, you know, we just didn't say, all right, if you're here for an open container, you'll see 10 minutes of open container. No, we're gonna have you sit for an hour and see what the consequences are of drinking in, uh, in public in a park. So that little kids the next morning, because the broken beer bottles that, uh, that have been left behind prevent them from playing in the park. Or to a, a store owner, if there's somebody using the side of their uh, alleyway for public urination purposes at night, 
that they'll see the impact that that has on the on the, sh the shop owner and the community as a whole. I think we so should change. So interactive. I think we should change the name. Because I'm, I'm telling you, the average person when they think community service is just that, you're servicing the community. Uh, and I, I just try and, I, I just, the first picture in my mind when I think community service is just that, you, you, you're, you're doing a project in a community, you work in, in a garden, a uh, public garden, you're helping seniors and a, and a, and a shelter, or whatever it is. I, it there was just, discussion about that. I think we tried to talk more about the idea of that it's an e-learning module that you're getting somewhat of a, of, a, of a civics lesson and also somewhat of, a, of an understanding of what your conduct is upon, you know, the impact you're having. It might be a, a low-level offense, previously criminal, but you're having an impact on the community. And mm. moreover, by adopting the ideas of uh, procedural fairness to make sure that they don't do it again after they've sat through that, uh, that for one hour and, and, and we've also added an extra hour. And I, I that's the part that's in the works right I, now. I love the program. Uh, don't get me Thank wrong. I, I think it's great. I, I just, just in terms of semantics here, is I, you know, many of us when I think community service, because there were many other programs where they say community service, this is what you end up doing. Maybe they should call it community civ civic something something. I don't know. There, there's uh, been have discussions writers. around changing the name to reflect what's happening. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank Our you. next panel will be representatives from the Center for Court Innovation, the Fines and Fees Justice Center, Brooklyn Defender Services, um, I, uh, the Harvard Law School Criminal Justice Policy Program, and Bronx Defenders. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you'd raise your right hand so you can get sworn in and we can get started. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. Good. Um, if you have written testimony, please make sure you give it to the Sergeant of Arms so we can follow along, read ahead, cut right to the important parts, you know. Um, any preference for who wants to start first? Want to, how about we just... Go from our left to right, is that good? Okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna ask the Sergeant at Arms to put five minutes on the clock. If you feel an urgent need to speak longer, we'll indulge you, but we got a lot of panelists and we wanna get, uh, get through it all. Ready? Sure. Go. Um, I plan to speak only for three. Just uh, turn the mic on and, and bring it closer to you. I think it's on. Red light. Yeah, it's on. Okay, um, my name is Mitali Nagrecha. I'm at the Criminal Justice Policy Program at Harvard Law School. And I've worked on the issue of high fees and fines since 2010, so about a decade now. Um, and in my current role, we started to look at day fines as a potential solution for the US. And so over the last year, I was in Germany conducting research into how exactly day fines look in practice. And it is based on that research that I will quickly raise sort of six high level lessons um, and then I'm happy to answer more detailed questions. Um, I'm also drawing upon lessons implementing some of these recommendations across the country, including in North Carolina, Arkansas, and other jurisdictions. Um, so the, the first lesson is that it is possible and actually I think 
quite easy to transition a system from one that does not look at ability to pay upfront to one that does. Um, that was an easy transition in Germany, and judges and prosecutors today will basically tell you that they could not imagine a different system, um, that they really buy into the idea that fees and fines should be tailored to a person's circumstances. Um, and they also, like judges or adjudicators in our systems, talk about how busy they are, and yet they see this, um, this I think, actually small amount of time, which I'll get to, to be worth, worth the effort. Um, and so I think, you know, the first point is that, you know, we're very glad that the city council is looking into this. The second point, though, is that day fines are not a magic bullet. Um, they say that we should look at someone's ability to pay up front, but they don't tell you what that means, right? So it's only with robust standards that limit how much a person of someone's income they should be paying towards their fine at all will they actually make a difference um, and, and increase fairness for people who are low income? And so it's important to define success as accomplishing that, as lowering the fines for people at the lower end, um, and to set clear standards, um, hopefully in this uh, pilot legislation as well, that say you know X percentage of someone's income should only go to their fines or something along those lines. Um, and so that kind of leads to my third point, which is that there should be such clear guidelines. Um, we have detailed thresholds in a report that we've done on proportionality of fees and fines. Um, one example is that in North Carolina, the, in Mecklenburg County, the judges implemented a standard that said it could be that only 10% of your net income after all of your expenses, so your 10% of your discretionary income, should go towards fines. Um, and um, the reason for that is that, for especially for people living at the lower end of the income spectrum, it should not be a big portion of discretionary income that go, goes towards fines. Um, the fourth point is that for day fines to be a productive um, innovation in New York City, that the that the implementing authorities need to be very, very careful about the offenses that are selected. Um, the thing you don't want to do is to widen the net by, by imp implementing a reform that looks like it's more fair, but really just increases incentives to police low-level cases, to bring people in on violations, to punish crimes of poverty. Um, a very clear example, and I know it's not probably at issue you know, in this particular pilot, but just for color would be something like fair evasion. So there are a lot, there's a lot of other innovation and advocacy in the city to um, get people fair cards. That's a better approach, not fair fines in that context. And so that would likely apply to some things that come before oath as well. Um, the fifth point is that Germany's entire system, so any, so all misdemeanors punishable by up to one year of punishment, so things like assault, DUIs, they're all punished by day fines. For all of those cases, courts rely on people's testimony to, um, to ascertain someone's ability to pay. They have trust in what people are telling them. There is no documentation. Um, and I'm sort of happy to talk more about what that looks like. But as I think was discussed earlier, the judge asks a few simple questions and or a person fills out a form that has a few simple questions about their um, ability to pay. And I think part of it is trust. That's how they make how, how the system works. The other piece is um, sort of not, uh, not obsessing over perfection. I think it's, you know, we want to get sort of a ballpark um, that, that means that the fine is sort of affordable, but you know, worrying about whether the person forgot to mention $100 is really not um, a real problem, and, and research supports that. Um, and the sixth point is that um, in setting up the pilot program, what we also found in Germany is that there are, are often cultural barriers between adjudicators and the people who come before the court. And so things that sound affordable to a judge or an adjudicator at oath um, are not necessarily affordable for the people before the court. Um, and so we want to make sure that whatever standards are set for how much these fines are um, don't sort of rely on current amounts, um, but really truly reflect people's ability to pay and to get input as to what that should look like. Um, 
and yeah, and to be sort of comfortable with the fact that these numbers might look l lower or lower to someone who has a good salary, but but may not be too low for the person before the court. Um, and kind of a, a related point, you know, it sounds like not on the table is increasing fines um, on the higher end. I just want to reframe that. So I don't think the reason to increase fines, and I. I, I I don't really care one way or another if you do, but I think the reason for increasing fines isn't to say we're trying to compensate for people on the low end. It's to say the way fines are set today and sort of how that legislative process probably worked, it's, it's with the fact, what's in mind usually is the fact that that fine has to apply to everyone. And once we sort of break down that basic structure and say we're going to tailor it, there may be room to increase the fines for people who do have a higher income. And again, it's not because we're trying to be meaner to them, but to actually reflect what it is that would be the equivalent fine um, for someone who's making more money. So. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Smith. I'm an attorney and the Youth Justice Debt Fellow at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you to the council and the com and committee chairs, Lanceman and Cabrera, uh, for holding this hearing. Um, Every day, indigent New Yorkers are punished with court-imposed fines, fees, and surcharges. They have no meaningful ability to pay. Um, like all sanctions, these have a serious, regressive, and disproportionate effect on people of color, on black, Latinx, and poor communities, and people's families. Uh, and those are the people who are targeted by the criminal legal system. When a person doesn't pay, they may face warrants, incarceration, or civil judgment, destroying their credit. And no one should face these kinds of severe repercussions because of a monetary sanction that never took into account their ability to pay, uh, especially in Brooklyn where 90% of criminal defendants cannot afford an attorney. Uh, fines, like all sanctions, should not have a harsher effect on the poor. They should not be ruinous to indigent people and merely inconvenient to people with means. And the day fines pilot does have the potential to begin to alleviate that punishment of poverty. Uh, by eliminating unaffordable oath fines. However, we have some concerns. Uh, first of all, even a proportionate fine regime will not establish a fair and equal punishment system because of the deep inequalities uh, in enforcement um, that determine who receives a sanction in the first place. Uh, to the extent day fines would be implemented to, uh, to address so-called quality of life offenses, um, those, those offenses often relate to poverty or arise from bias enforcement practices, and even a day fine is not going to be truly fair. Um, those kinds of quality of life offenses arising from poverty or lack of access to resources should be addressed by providing more of those resources. For example, with public urination, we should provide uh, more public bathrooms, and that's something we continue to, uh, to urge. Uh, second, the pilot should provide meaningful access to alternative sanctions across the board. Uh, that means first, availability to people who have zero disposable income, as many of our clients do. Um, not requiring a court appearance to access those alternatives. Uh, I believe that, uh, that Chair Cabrera recently mentioned community service and having to come in in person. Right now, that's only available if you come in to have your oath hearing in person. Um, and that, of course, limits it from people who cannot afford childcare, transportation, uh, or to take a day off work. Um, and finally, there shouldn't be any mandatory minimum fines in the day fines program, because that reduces substantive equality at the lowest income levels. Um, finally, Chair Cabrera and uh, Council Member Rose both mentioned this issue of taxation by citation uh, that we've seen in the city before. Uh, it's critical that the revenue motive does not come into play in assessing whether any day pilot, day fine pilot program is a success. Um, moving on to the uh, drug arrest and conviction collateral consequences audit, uh, BDS supports uh, T2019-5492, uh, requiring an audit of all city agencies on their policies regarding collateral consequences of drug arrests and convictions. Um, however, we recommend amendments so that the audit includes all arrests and convictions, not just those related to drugs. Uh, we would also respectfully urge the council to extend the scope of the audit to include adverse actions by agencies against applicants for employment in addition to current employees and adverse actions against people targeted for enforcement by agencies 
uh, such as Chair Lansman mentioned, the families under investigation by the Administration for Children's Services. Uh, ultimately, with respect to drug arrest and convictions, BDS believes that a public health approach uh, is essential to reduce the harms of substance use disorder and other drug use. Uh, in terms of harm reduction, the criminal legal system is really ill-equipped to prevent drug use, uh, meaningfully reduce the supply of drugs, or most importantly, help keep people who use drugs as safe as possible and minimize harm to communities and families. Uh, Portugal's model for drug policy suggests that we may be able to dramatically reduce overdose deaths and serious harms through a careful and deliberate decriminalization of use and possession of all drugs, along with an aggressive public health strategy. Uh, in that country, heroin use has been cut by an estimated 75%. Uh, more importantly, uh, overdose deaths have plummeted. Um, Portugal has the lowest rate of drug-induced death in Western Europe. It's less than 2% of the overdose death rate in the United States. Um, in light of the overdose epidemic, specifically with regard to opioids, lawmakers should really study this model seriously, import its successes, in addition to the collateral consequence analysis. Uh, thank you to the Council for the opportunity to speak on these issues. Uh, we hope you will continue to view BDS as a resource. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Joanna Weiss. I'm the co-director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. We're a national organization that seeks to uh, restore integrity to our justice system by eliminating fees and making sure that any fines that are imposed are proportionate both to the offense and the individual. Fines and fees hurt New Yorkers and New York City. They make our communities less safe. They perpetuate and exacerbate poverty and they extract millions of dollars from our most vulnerable communities, and particularly from communities of color. I want to thank the council uh, and committee chairs Cabrera and Lanceman uh, for bringing us together to talk about uh, the possibility of a day fines pilot program at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, or OATH. Uh, we think that this program would constitute an important step towards ensuring that the imposition of fines in New York City are both fair and equitable. Um, I also want to thank the Council for the other steps that they've taken to reform the way fines and fees are administered in New York City. Um, the Fines and Fees Justice Center supports the proposed uh, day fines pilot, although we have some, some caveats and concerns that we would want to think through as, as such a, a pilot program was addressed. Um, as has been well discussed today, um, when we have flat fines, they're inherently regressive compared to a day fines, which can, be, um, which can take people's into account, uh, means into account. The other thing is that when we impose fines, if they're truly to improve public safety and health, um, they're meant to deter people from committing an offense again. But what deters me may be very different from what deters somebody at minimum wage and is very different from what would deter Bill Gates or Donald Trump Jr. Um, we shouldn't expect New Yorkers to pay the same. We should be looking for the lowest sanction possible to deter behavior from continuing. Um, I want to try not to repeat what some of my friends and colleagues have said. Um, I do want to add that the day fines pilots in the 80s and 90s provide promising evidence um, that a properly designed and operating day fines program can be efficient and effective at calculating a person's ability to pay, um, as well as being a more equitable sanctioning scheme. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the selection also of the kinds of offenses that might be included in such a pilot program. I know that Oath would have the opportunity to choose 10 offenses that are issued by at least two different uh, agencies. We recommend that the day fines violations um, be chosen from ones that are particularly harming poor communities and communities of color to be sure to operate the right relief. Um, we were thinking of things like uh, offenses that are uh, imposed on street vendors uh, or taxi drivers who we know are suffering right now a lot of economic harms. But I think that the best way to really understand what are the harms that fines are causing community is to have more community engagement and to learn from community organizations what are the fines that are pain points in the community and how do we address them. Um, I also thought, uh, looking at the New York Times article that came out a few months ago about building codes violations that are meant to protect worker safety um, and, present, and prevent serious building accidents instead are being enforced heavily on, on single family owners, uh, single family homeowners, um, instead of developers that are actually 
inattentive to the building code and causing workplace accidents. And those fines are having massive harms uh, on individuals and their families. We need to ensure that ordinary New Yorkers are not substantially harmed financially, let alone ruined by the same fines that are treated by developers as the cost of doing business. Um, for a day fines program to be successful, it has to impose as few burdens as possible on the people who are subjected to fines. Most people who appear at oath are not represented by a lawyer. Many don't speak English as a first language. Many can't take off work to handle a low-level violation. Um, so any of the solutions that are offered need to be available online, and that includes a day fine model uh, where uh, fines can be lowered for people who are, who are low income or potentially raised for people who are high income, um, but also there needs to be another alternative for people who have no income at all, like the community service uh, or education modules that are available now for CJRA offenses, but we also recognize that these need to be accessible, so they need to be available online as an alternative. There also needs to be the capacity of judges to simply waive fines when it's in the interest of justice. Um, we've talked a little bit about self-reporting, and we agree that self-reporting, all research shows that this is a very uh, reasonable and viable options for accurate um, assessments of people's income. And in fact, past day fines pilots suggest that people may even overestimate how much their income is. Um, and finally, we appreciate the council wants to evaluate the day fines program, and we've we work with researchers who would be happy to assist on that, um, but we also want to talk about how we look at revenue as part of that um, evaluation and just reaffirm that the pilot should not be deemed a success based on revenue. Um, courts are not revenue centers, and we should be evaluating the programs on how well they dispense justice, not on how much revenue is brought in. Thank you very much for, for letting me testify about this and, and for bringing this important uh, topic to us today. Thank you. Terrific. Good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, co-chairs Cabrera and Lansman, and other members. My name's Adam Mansky, and I'm Director of Criminal Justice at the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, we are a nonprofit dedicated to creating a more humane, fair, and effective justice system. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify and to submit written testimony regarding to, uh, the proposed day fines pilot. To us, the Envision pilot responds to a need and opportunity to reduce the harmful effects of fines and fees on low income and marginalized communities in New York City. Failing to adjust financial penalties to what individuals can afford can perpetuate cycles of poverty and produce continuing system involvement resulting from non-payment. As we've learned from our work as the technical assistance provider in a national price of justice initiative, adjusting fines to people's actual ability to pay is a cutting edge practice that jurisdictions are beginning to, many jurisdictions are beginning to adopt. In 2019 alone, California and Washington state implemented computerized ability to pay assessments designed to rigorously identify individuals whose financial situation merits a reduction in a fine or fee. Michigan, North Carolina, and Texas, and the counties of San Francisco and Mecklenburg uh, have distributed, have all distributed bench cards or launched other reforms designed to lessen burdens of a fine, including self-reporting. Here in New York, the bail reform law that goes into effect next month includes trailblazing language requiring criminal courts to consider individual financial circumstances and ability to post bail without posing undue hardship in cases that remain eligible for bail. We see an opportunity now to bring these, these types of pioneering reforms to New York City's civil justice system as well. The most important domains for measuring someone's ability to pay, or, uh, pay a fine are well known, collecting information on household size and household income, together allowing for comparing an individual's financial resources against thresholds contained in the federal, uh, sorry, Collecting information on household uh, size and household income together allow for comparing an individual's financial resources against thresholds contained in the federal poverty guidelines. People's expenses, if unusually high, may merit a fur further adjustment in what they can afford. And finally, the living situation should be determined, for instance, to know whether someone has a current or recent history of homelessness. 
Recognizing that po federal poverty standards under underestimate thresholds below with the thresholds below which people experience financial strain, uh, especially in an expensive city like New York City, we would need a thoughtful approach that combines national best practices and good stakeholder and community outreach to obtain meaningful input and build trust in a final approach. As for the key step of providing meaningful alternatives, which have been discussed here, in 2017, Oath partnered with the Center for Court Innovation to provide an in-person community service and e-learning uh, program in lieu of fines ranging from $1 to $1,000. In person, the community service options uh, included facilitated group sessions focused on how to avoid receiving another summons and community service projects such as assembling hygiene kits to be distributed to those in need. However, in our experience, about 78% of participants, given the option, opted for the e-learning um, when they were given the option between completing community service or going through this e-learning module to receive a one-hour alternative mandate. The e-learning tool created by Cent uh, Oath and the Center for Court Innovation in conjunction with MOCJ and City Council um, uh, this module provides information about the CJRA, other civil offenses, and how users can change their behavior to avoid receiving other summonses in the future. The module uses the principles of procedural justice, respect, understanding, neutrality, and voice, and a variety of user interactions, including role plays, matching games, and videos, to create an informative and enjoyable user experience. Initial data shows that 91% of users found what they learned to be useful, and 89% reported feeling positively at the end. The Center and Oath have recently developed an additional e-learning module for people who have, larger, who have received larger fines, and a website that will allow these modules to be completed remotely. This will be available in the coming weeks. In sum, the Center for Court Innovation generally agrees with the concept of establishing a day fines pilot as a first step towards rigorously considering people's financial resources and where appropriate linking them to alternatives. I want to thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Ivan Bohorquez, and I am a legal advocate in the civil action practice of the Bronx Defenders. I'll be testifying in regards to the citywide audit only. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your interest in this important matter. As a civil legal advocate, I provide direct representation, advocacy, and support for clients who are entangled in multiple legal systems. I see regularly how drug-related accusations and convictions can lead to a whole host of direct, devastating civil consequences, not only for the person accused, but for their entire family. As holistic public defenders in the Bronx, we have seen how drug-related arrests have led to the loss or suspension of city-regulated occupational licenses or clearance, the denial of an application to or termination from or permanent exclusion of family members in New York City housing authorities, public housing, and the seizure of cash and other important property by the New York City Police Department. When faced with such consequences, we, see, we have seen how individuals stand to lose their income, homes, licenses, and livelihoods without the right to counsel to represent them in civil court or civil administrative proceedings with less constitutional protections than available in criminal court. In my written testimony, which I will submit later today, I have included data that sheds light on who, who is being affected, as well as several examples of clients of the Bronx defenders. Um, for brevity, I will highlight two. Mr. A.W. worked um, as an art teacher in a New York City public school where he had been a founding faculty member. One morning, he was, he was making chalk drawings on the sidewalk in front of his building when police officers approached him. He was arrested after an officer alleged that he recovered a cigarette believed to be marijuana, which had been dropped to the ground. The New York City Department of Education was notified through the Division of Criminal Justice Services at the time of arrest, and Mr. A.W. was immediately suspended from work, uh, pending the outcome of his case. Many months after he was arraigned, he was offered an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. Because this allowed him to return to work, he accepted this outcome rather than, than continue to fight the case to full acquittal. 
Mr. A.W. missed over a year of classes at the school he loved as a result of this arrest. Another client, Mr. A.S., lived with his elderly mother in their New York City Housing Authority apartment for over 25 years. When his mother passed away, Mr. A.S. had to fight for succession rights to his mother's tenancy and get a lease in his name. When he was younger, Mr. A.S. went undiagnosed with mental health impairments and had various interactions with the criminal legal system relating to the use of drugs, which he used to self-medicate. Mr. A.S., now in his 50s and clinically diagnosed, still struggles with substance abuse. One day he was arrested for buying a pill from an individual who turned out to be an undercover officer. While fighting his criminal court case, NYCHA stated this arrest was the reason he should not get a lease in his name. The criminal court diverted his case and he participated in mandated treatment. Nevertheless, NYCHA sought to evict him and prevent him from getting a lease. After, after connecting with the Bronx defenders, we were able to successfully challenge his lease denial and also successfully defend against his eviction. However, many public housing residents and their family members are not lucky enough to obtain representation and to stand, and stand to lose their housing based on drug arrest, even those deemed related to substance abuse problems. Both, both client experiences exemplify the, how the criminalization of drugs disrupts the precarious balance of New Yorkers' lives and leads to a host of other destabilizing, destabilizing problems. Given the civil consequence and punishments that exist, we support an amendment to the New York City Charter that would mandate a citywide audit of collateral consequences for drug arrests drug arrest and convictions. This would allow for a full assessment of how the lives of individuals accused of drug crimes are impacted and would give a bigger picture of barriers that exist. Our hope is that such an audit would be comprehensive and far-reaching. We hope that impacted communities will be consulted towards these ends. The results of any audit should be made publicly available and accessible on an annual basis. And once such data is collected, our hope is that the city will commit to eradicating these practices that unjustly and disproportionately harm marginalized communities of color and those who struggle with substance abuse. The spirit of which is an antithetical to the important criminal justice reforms that have passed to improve the lives of impacted individuals. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, so let me ask uh, a series of questions and then I'll pass it off to uh, my co-chair. Um, Ms. Uh, Nagreka, am I, am I pronouncing that right? Thanks. Um, you, you, I, you recalled, you said something to the effect that be careful about the offenses yeah. that are selected, I'm paraphrasing. What did you mean by that sentiment and what should we and, and, and Mock J and Oath be looking out for? Um, yeah, I think, hmm, yeah, so I think there's a, a tricky balance here, right? So one misapplication of day fines is to sort of distract from over policing or over enforcement or disproportionate policing in certain neighborhoods and say, well, you know, that doesn't matter. The amount of the fine is fair. And that's not what we're trying to do. Um, and so I think we want to find offenses where people generally agree that there is likely going to be a fine for this offense and that there isn't a whole lot of contention over doing that at all, such as fair evasion. It's just an easy example. I know it's not on the table here. Um, and to you know, find those offenses where you know they're likely to be ticketed in in ways that are um, fair, but that the amounts need to be adjusted. And so I think it's a you know a balance of not picking things that only apply to wealthy landlords or something, um, and, and things that aren't sort of um, reinforcing practices of um, you know over policing in minority neighborhoods, um, so, quality of life. So what, so. You mean find offenses where there's broad public acknowledgement that the person shouldn't be doing the thing that the application of, of enforcement is, is fair, where, where people have confidence right. that this is an offense that people are being appropriately uh, right. held accountable for. That's what you mean? I think that's right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, then my question for... Um, the, uh, I think it was, um, you're from Brooklyn Defender? Brooklyn yeah. Um, I know when we were doing CJRA um, and, and other things we were doing related to low-level offenses, 
there was a, a lot of concern on the part of the public defenders. We were in the criminal realm, right? Even if we were talking about violations, criminal court, about um, allowing people to plead guilty by mail. I just want to understand when we're talking about these civil offenses that are that are that are um, in front of oath. It seems that you are uh, recommending that that the ability to to plead guilty by mail or online um, should be available and expanded. So I, I understand if that's your point of view, I understand it. I just want to flesh it out a, a little bit. Your view on allowing people to, to plead guilty, accept fees, fines, et cetera, by mail in this, these civil cases. Thank you for highlighting that distinction. I think there is a difference between a, a criminal sanction and a civil one. Here, if we're talking about a, the current state of availability of alternative sanctions in the civil context at oath, right now, even to get this e-learning module, you have to physically attend your hearing date. And I think uh, the representative from MockJ also talked about all the costs of, of that kind of attendance. So here, uh, that, that uh, those alternative sanctions should be available um, by mail or online for people who um, cannot attend in person, and that really serves the substantive equality um, point of this day fines pilot. Okay. Um, and, and just on the, um, the collateral consequences audit, we, we, you might have heard me earlier um, say that I did think it was important for the city in doing that audit to also identify state and federal policies or mandates that, that impose collateral consequences. And, and we are going to read the bill carefully and make sure that um, that, that is part of the, the audit. I know you mentioned that in your written testimony um, as well. Um, and then uh, you, you had mentioned, uh, it's good to see you, by the way. Good to see you. I mean, it's good to see you all, but it's good to see her, too. <laughs> Um, we've done a lot of work together on this issue. Um, specifically, we recommend implementing day fines for violations often imposed on low-income and vulnerable New Yorkers, such as unlawful vending or fines imposed by um, taxi drivers. Those are, you give a couple of examples. You want to expand on that um, a little bit? Are you able to expand on that a little bit? What, what in your experience, are, are some of the fines, some of the um, offenses that particularly impact low-income New Yorkers? Sure. Um, and Full disclosure, um, I am currently the co-director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center, but I should also acknowledge that I was once the Deputy Administrative Justice Coordinator. Um, and I served actually as Commissioner Golden's deputy for six years, uh, working to improve access to justice at the city's administrative tribunals. Um, so my information is a little bit out of date, um, but it comes from, from doing a lot of work at Oath and seeing the kinds of violations that were imposed He remembered there. the Staten Island pilot from like three <laughs> decades ago. So. <laughs> We, we call that institutional memory. It's, it's valuable. Well, thank At least you. some people think it's valuable. Nowadays, you know, if you've been on Twitter for five minutes, you're an expert. But I digress. Right. Um, I mean, there were a lot of types of offenses that judges regularly acknowledged that it was very painful to put in place because they knew that the economic consequence uh, to some people was, was excruciating versus other people where they knew it was the cost of doing business. Um, so I brought up the building codes ones. Another one that I can think of off the top of my head are illegal postings. Um, you're not supposed to put up a, a paper flyer on, on public property. Um, and for every paper that the police find, they can issue a, a citation of, I think, $75. Um, people can rack up hundreds, even thousands of dollars in citations, mm -hmm. um, where if it's a business and they're putting those properties up to advertise themselves, this is a cost of doing business. To an individual who's trying to start a daycare center in their, mm -hmm. in their um, house and they don't realize that that's a violation, you know, hitting them with thousands of dollars of fines is a big problem. There are a lot of kinds of fines like that that are, that are issued and heard at oath. Um, that's why I brought up that, that uh, New York Times story as well about building codes violations. Those are codes, those are violations that can, um, there's a penalty that can be imposed every single day until something is fixed. If you're talking about an average New Yorker who doesn't have experience with the building code, they can easily rack up hundreds or thousands of dollars in debt um, where again, for a developer, um, 
it, it might be a cost of doing business to ignore the building code um, and actually put people in danger. So we want to look at those things where if we really care about public safety, um, that we're enforcing public safety and not burdening uh, people with massive fines. But also back to the other idea is that, you know, I, I'm looking at this as an outsider and a third party because I haven't had these fo any fines imposed on me that I couldn't afford to pay. And I think what we really need to do is an assessment of the kinds of, of fines that are imposed by the city generally um, and really make sure that we are uh, imposing fines that need to be uh, imposed in order to protect public health and safety, um, make sure that those fines are not being disproportionately imposed on poor communities and communities of color, figure out which of those fines also uh, could, the punishment could be a warning or some, uh, something else other than uh, a fine, um, but really also talking to community organizations to figure out which fines are, are harming communities. Um, and, you know, CCI, I want to thank you very much for a very thorough testimony and, and, and analysis. You go in, in the written testimony uh, some length about the factors that would go into determining someone's financial ability to pay, et cetera. Um, can you just tell us uh, how much of a burden do you think this would impose on, on the process, on oath? Um, was I being naive when I said, you know, you ask five set questions and you get to where you need to go? Like, what are we talking about about here? Uh, I mean, I'll just open by saying I'm not an expert. Um, I, I think that, you know, of course, I think we're talking about a self-reported model um, as opposed to some of the other jurisdictions. Uh, I do think that it probably could be limited to several questions, um, and I, I, I would you know, that, that seems manageable to me, but I would probably defer a little bit to oath on that. And um, Ms. Nagreka, in the experience of other jurisdictions, um, how long and how disruptive is it to the, to, the, to the process of, you know, hundreds of cases that each one has to have this kind of evaluation? Um, I, if I was to guess a number, I think 30 seconds or less, I mean, I think it can be pretty fast um, and get to a place that's accurate enough so that the fine is not disproportionate to the person's economic circumstances. Um, and I think there's ways to build in um, relatively easy protection so that if someone has, I don't know, a big healthcare expense that they need to tell the oath officer about that would sort of cut against a basic calculation based on their income, that they can, they can be prompted to bring those things up, um, again, with relative ease. And so, um, in Germany, again, they really ask two to three questions. There, the things that are most important are your net income, uh, your number of dependents, um, and, and sort of big expenses. Those are the things that they ask about. Um, like I said, we've also implemented um, similar models, day fines light maybe, um, in jurisdictions um, in the US. And so, for example, in North Carolina, in a very busy misdemeanor court in Mecklenburg, um, the judges, again, spent some amount of time under one minute um, asking the questions that are, they're prompted to ask on the bench card, um, and it sort of follows the day fines concept. So I think it's, it's quite fast. And then my last question um, for the, the Bronx the defenders, um, it's a, the same question I asked before. In your, in your experience, what are the kinds of offenses that your, because the bill is written, gives um, oath and, and Mach J the leeway to identify 10 offenses. In your experience, what are the, the offenses that your clients are most frequently hit with that they have the most difficulty in being able to pay fines? Um, I'm, I won't be able to answer to the direct offenses, but I will be able to answer towards a lot of the consequences that are being seen. Right, and so a lot of the clients that we that we see now run into a lot of issues with property forfeiture, um, employment and licensing, and access to public housing and maintaining that public housing. Um, in terms of offenses, um, because I don't have the answer, I will be more than gladly to get that information from my colleagues and provide that to you later today. Well, we, we would appreciate that, and, and probably from Brooklyn as, as well. Um, 
and they would be good insight. Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much, and uh, let's recognize who we've been joined by Council Member uh, Cohen here today. Uh, I wanted to know, do you have any data uh, to show us how effective these e-learning modules that people take, do they, do we see any positive results we, in terms we, of people we have, being the finding The Center it? for Court Innovation has not done a, um, a, an analysis of impact. That was not part of what we were asked to do. I'm not sure if Oath has been looking at that. Um, <coughs> So I guess my big question is, if it was shown worst case scenario, and I hope this is, wouldn't be the reality, that it didn't have an effect, that people are continuing doing whatever they were doing before, uh, would, should we continue having the e-learning if it's having no effect? I think that's a policy decision. I would just say that I think that what we are trying to do is come up with a proportionate response to uh, these kinds of situations, these kinds of offending. And uh, I, I actually commend City Council and the city for uh, making the effort to create both, uh, to reduce the, the collateral consequences that were coming from these when they were criminal summonses um, and the effort to reduce the penalty and, and burden on low-income people by giving them a, uh, uh, some other non-monetary um, obligation to, to satisfy what they're doing. I, I also will say that the, the initiative is anchored in notions of procedural justice, uh, that when people feel that they've been treated with respect and understand what's going on and feel that they have a voice, um, they are more likely to feel that the process has been a fair one. And there is some research to show they're more likely to comply with their obligations. And uh, the, certainly in the instance of the e-learning tool and the educational groups, uh, we focused very significantly on ensuring that those components were, were you know, um, included, embedded in the, in the curriculum. Do you think this is data that we should be looking into gathering? Uh, it's hard for me to, t I mean, I, I don't know how easy it would be to, to, to gather that. Um, again, I think that would be a, a function of um, either oath or, or mock to no, that's be what able I mean. to track oath. it. But I yeah. mean, you know, I, I, I guess that, you know, of course it's a calculus that's always worth um, considering. But I would also just affirm the idea that if people have an experience as they are at least reporting, um, where they're learning things and finding the experience to be a very positive one. That's a very different experience from the one we traditionally think people have when they're going to, um, you know, to a hearing or, or whatever. I know, but I, I will want that experience to translate into action. Mm -hmm. And so Fair. in Absolutely. real life, because otherwise, uh, then the effect of the purpose, the initial purpose of having the e-learning would have failed. I mean, I, I would think that maybe we would have to look at the content, uh, maybe the methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's nothing wrong with the process, it's just the content uh, material or, you know, or looking at other innovative ways uh, to go about it. But I, I'm into results. I want to see results. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't want people to go through something and it doesn't translate into real life because then the initial purpose for the analysts don't find anybody or have them go through the e-learning in the first place if it doesn't have you know a personal impact. Mm -hmm. And so again, I'm I'm all for what we're talking about here today. I just always looking how uh, we can make it better. I, I love uh, the comment, I forgot who mentioned it, uh, that we don't want to do taxation by citation. I love the line. I don't know who mentioned that. Uh, you could take the credit. Uh, but it, it, it kind of um, goes uh, against, uh, it, it actually supports what I was sharing earlier, that what I don't want to see is, and I know it was mentioned uh, uh, by two of the panelists here today, 
of increasing uh, for those who are more wealthy. And let me make uh, my case and, and bring more clarification. The one, I don't, I don't want this class war that often occurs. Second of all, if we do that, then we're supporting the system of taxation by citation. Uh, we, I, I don't want a system that I saw here uh, when I first got here in 2010. They were taking ticketing people left and right. And trust me, it will happen again. Then they started targeting the taxi drivers, many which live in my community. They were looking for cash cows. Uh, and, and when uh, government officials get desperate about trying to find sources of income uh, to pay for bad decisions uh, that were made previously and not prepare for recessions, not prepare for bad times, I, I really fear uh, that, uh, and then at the, and the end of the day, to me, it's not just. Why should I have to pay more, anybody? And by the way, these are not gonna be the billionaires. They get driven, okay? Uh, they, they, it's not gonna be them. Uh, this is gonna be the middle class uh, that always gets stuck at the end of the day paying a uh, tremendous amount of taxes, um, camouflage forms of taxation that we have here in the city. Uh, and, and so that's why we, we wanna support uh, the idea of increasing to compensate. So that, what that tells me if we say is to compensate is that we wanna, we wanna have a more uh, uh, more funding's coming in, and that's, that's not the idea of why we give people tickets. Does that make sense? Who wants to pick that up? Um, I mean, I certainly understand what you're saying. Uh, and I will say, you know, like Ms. Negretcha, I don't feel particularly strongly uh, about what happens to fines at the top. That being said, you know, and I agree that fines should not be used to generate revenue. I have two responses, though. I mean, one is that uh, we're supposed to be using fines to deter behaviors we don't want. And so the deterrent value should actually be equal, both for people at the top of the economic scale and at the bottom of the economic scale. And I also say, and, and you know, we talk about this in our office, that you know, if we um, suddenly incentivized enforcement against you know, <laughs> a rich white dude driving a Mercedes, I feel like reform happens incredibly quickly when that's the case um, versus the people getting burdened at the bottom of, uh, of the scale um, who often have no voices. So it's a slight pushback about what you're saying, but again, um, you know, my real interest in what is what happens to people at the bottom, um, I care less about what happens to people at the top. And, and to that, I, I, I have to say that the root of the fruit problem here is what I mentioned earlier that certain neighborhoods are being targeted. And as long as that happens, it doesn't matter how we try to configure more here, more there, we're gonna to continue to have this problem. We're gonna to try to f dance around it. The fact is, uh, communities like mine, communities uh, that uh, historically have you know, suffered economically, uh, they, they are being targeted. I mean, hands down, I can't wait to get all the data and appreciate uh, uh, the willingness of the administration uh, uh, to bring it forth. But I know for a fact that this is happening and there's no way on earth that it happens because it's being done more in one neighborhood versus another uh, and, and all across, you know. I can understand if you have certain neighborhoods, you know, you, uh, wealthy here, they're doing the same amount of fractions as here, but then you have uh, another ones that are at the same level. But when you, you, when you have this versus this, as long as we have that, uh, and so anything to, you know, to address that, I, I think will get to the heart of the problem. And, and so, but I appreciate uh, all the comments. I have to take it to heart. Uh, 
everything that was mentioned by all of you, you're doing fantastic work. We have to do something about uh, this problem. Uh, you mentioned uh, the ticketing to a business. I knew a gentleman f uh, who lost his business just because of what you just mentioned. Uh, and, and it was, he, he paid somebody to go and put the flyers out. It was cars, I was just business cars. And he put them in the wrong places. He ended up with a $75,000 fine. Uh, this is before I became an elected official. And he ended up giving up his business. He had it shut down. That was his livelihood. It was very sad. Um, and these are some of the things that are pushing some of the New Yorkers to live New York where they're not being harassed uh, in, in other states. Thank you so much. With that, I give it back to my coach here. Any questions? No. Thank you very much. And that concludes our hearing for today.